All right. Well, first of all, thanks again for uh, the hardwares for bringing me another beer and another Freaknik talk. How many has this been in a row? Not many. Not many? No, I mean talks in a row that you brought me a beer. One. You did it last year, didn't you? And you did it the year before that and the year before that. All right, no, you all right, it wasn't last year. All right, the year before that and the year before that, though. Yeah. All right. Anyway, my talk tonight is going to be on Netcoff, uh, Network King of the Hill. Basically, it's a CTF for lazy bastards like me. And, and also, yes, not Larry. Not Larry, come up here. Oh, get closer because I might call on you a little bit. All right, work your way up here later on. All right. My name is Aiden Crenshaw. I run IronGeek.com. Hope some of y'all visited it before. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know everything. I'm just a geek with time in my hands. Sometimes I get things wrong. Let me know if I do. Uh, I'm a regular on the ISD podcast. Podcast about five times a week. I'm usually on on Thursdays. And I'm a senior information security engineer at a Fortune 1000 company. Because I used the word bastard at the beginning of my slides, I didn't put the actual name of the company. All right. And I'm also a co-founder of DerbyCon. Come on up and see us if you get a chance or down depending on where you came to get to here. Also, this is, I think, my eighth Freaknik in a row. And uh, this is actually my very first HackerCon was Freaknik 2005. All right, a little bit about running a CTF. It's a pain in the ass. I think not Larry can agree with me on this. He's ran more CTFs than I have. And the one regular CTF I ever ran, it was a pain in the ass. You have to get all the gear there. And then while well, the gear gets there, it's got to work. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have the, there's a mixture of things. VMs have made things easier, but the problem is it also has you have one machine that could fail. As the old way, it's like, well, this box failed, this box failed. So it's less stuff to carry. It's a single point of failure. It's easy to set up, but it's also like that single point of failure. But egad, doing this before VMs, all the crap you had to bring with you. You, you made that point earlier, Ben, and yeah, that would not have been something I'd like to do. Yeah, you got to drag all that crap to the car, and that's a pain in the butt. Come up with different scenarios each year, because you've the same scenarios every single year. Whoever played it last year is going to be the one that's going to be the winner of the next year and the next year after that, or whoever read that someone else was right up online. So, oh, and also you have people like Dave Kennedy come in and pop your boxes and destroy it. And I'll tell you a little story about how I met Dave Kennedy. Actually, technically, I met him at like a Nauticon probably a couple years before this, but we got to know each other after um, Louisville InfoSec 2009. That was the first CTF I ever ran. Him and Martin Boss and Archangel and a couple of us were on the winning team. And they come in, and Dave didn't come to get me the scope for me first. So he's like, well, these boxes are on the network. I'll start attacking them. He's like, oh, this it looks interesting. I'll go to the desktop. Ooh, there's videos about the CTF. He seems to describe how to win the CTF. I think I popped the wrong box. <laughs> uh, apparently, there's an, there was not I had the firewall down. I was get, getting to do some stuff. And I had patched up to the current level, but there was an SMB2 vulnerability that had not been patched at that particular time. And Dave popped my box, and he came up and um, said, um, I think I may have compromised the wrong machine or something that I expected. I'm like, oh, crap. And so we got him straightened up, and he continued the game. As far as I know, he didn't use that knowledge, and they ended up winning anyway. Funny story is they would have figured out how to win 45 minutes earlier if they just figured out they could turn a webcam like 45 degrees. But we'll get a little more into that in a second. Here's the way I originally set the first CTF I ever did. And while it's not as bad as bringing six billion machines, I still had a fair amount of gear. First of all, we start off with a little wireless, uh, uh, ah, brain fart. I think I've had a little bit too much beer already. Uh, Wait, drink. Drink. You those words. You, you, you got that backwards. <laughs> all right. We had our wireless router. We had a webcam. We had a laptop with a couple of VMs and uh, another bat box out there that were attached to uh, the Wi-Fi on and off, on and off again. And that becomes important in a second. I actually have a video talking about the entire scenario out on my website already. But the steps that people had to do, and what I did was I set it up to where they made points for each flag they got. They had to accomplish a certain task and come tell me, like write it down on a piece of paper, and I'd give them the points. I did this because I didn't want them to be all or nothing. I wanted it to be, at least they felt like they accomplished something, even if they didn't complete the entire scenario. So the first thing was they had to attach to the wireless network. 
but um, the SID wasn't out, out there. It wasn't broadcast. So they had to turn on something like Kismet, go into monitor mode, find that SID, and then attach to it. Uh, Dave didn't, he didn't figure this one out. He just kind of went and went, oh, OK, let me see what's going on, and got a hold of it, him and uh, Martin and Archangel and everybody else on that team. And uh, they had to attach it, and they got a certain number of points. There was one person, I think, who never actually got past this particular step. But that was like the barrier of entry. Then I had to find the IP of a Windows box out there called um, WinCTF, owned by Eingeek Corp. And that was like in the description. It was a Windows box. You just had to end map the network, and you could generally find it. So I only gave him five points for that one. That was fairly simple. Then I had these IPs. Uh, it was of an x86 Linux box out there, and I specified x86 because technically that webcam I put out there would also come up as Linux, but it wasn't x86. And I'd give him some more points for that as well. And they had to list two open ports. A little more work of nmap. They also had to find a box uh, the admins are running the internet site from. So basically, they're looking around for port 80 on one of these boxes. And they got to find the web server type and version. That's as simple as doing a header grab. So they might tell net to it and, you know, uh, git space slash HTTP 1.0, whatever. Or just throw garbage at it and generally you're going to get a header back or just use live headers. Um, uh, then they had to figure out the administrator password on one of them. Now, it's been a while since I ran this one. I'm trying to remember how I had to set it up. I may have had an exploit where they could basically exploit in, then use um, Interpreter, dump the hashes, then crack the hashes, then they have the password. Well, of course, I'm doing reuse, so that same password could be used other places. So if they know to try that, that helps out. So they also have to figure out the links boxes, root password. And finally, they had to copy off this little uh, private, public, sorry, uh, private information file to actually be able to open it up and find out what's in it. And it was a true crypt volume, and I think I also had an embedded zip inside there someplace as well. They had to take the password for that. They had that, that gets extra 10 points. To get the password for the uh, x86-based Linux box, that was a 10 points. Passwords for the 7-zip archive, that I think it was inside of the uh, true crypt volume, the PII, uh, that was another 10 points. And decrypt the CV CSV file in that was 25 points. And once they opened up the CSV file, it was like, list of healthcare information of people I knew were at the conference, and I gave them various things like con-related stress, or I gave, I think John Strand got fear of clowns as his particular phobia. But that was the uh, protected information that was in there. So then I'd have to come up with that same kind of scenario next year, and it's actually much more involved than all that. And coming up with a new scenario every year is a pain in the butt. So I thought, well, what if I could make this more like a game of chess? Well, it's the same scenario, or possibly the same scenario every single year, but because they come at it a different way and they have different experiences, it becomes new every single time. So that came up to Netcar, basically because I'm a lazy bastard. Uh, forget scenarios. Let's just um, reuse the same setups over and over again, make things simple. Uh, players learn from past games and come up with better ways to pwn the same boxes and keep them pwned. So they may not win this year, and maybe the same scenario next year, but they, in the meantime, they're thinking, well, how, what, what did I screw up last time? How can I keep these boxes owned? How can I automate this? How can I better strategize and accomplish the task I want to accomplish? Um, contestants make it vary from game to game in and of themselves. Who's in the game? Uh, what new techniques they try? So it keeps it varied without me having to work on it. Now, how much when you each one of the root wars? How much of the scenario you change around each year? Totally different every year. So, and how much of a pain is it to come up with new? Actually, now I'm thinking about your audio won't come through, so I'm going to hand, hand you this next oh, you ever need to talk. That's, that's part of it. Now my audio works. Now your audio will work. I'm shocked. All right. Now, this is basically the way King of the Hills is set up. Though, technically, most of these boxes are all running on one VM. Um, this is how it works. Essentially, you have to keep a box and hold on to it. So it's King of the Hill. You get to the top of the hill, and you push everybody else off. You've got to stay there. You set your flag by defacing the website with your team's name, and you must keep the services on it running to get points. So 
it's not like you can own it and then stop the web service. Because if you do, well, you don't get any more points yourself. You may keep someone else from getting points, but it doesn't really help you out that much in the end. You can patch to keep others out, though usually this is on its own private network, so patching would be a pain. And uh, you can attack the network layer, at least in the versions I've ran so far, though there's some debate about changing that. Uh, here's the basic score rules. Each team will be given a range of IPs they're going to run against. And essentially, they're supposed to pwn these boxes and deface them with their own tag. Now, the way the tag works is, there's all sorts of ways I could count defacement, but I made it make it regular so I could easily write code to score it. So I basically make people write inside of a team tag, whatever their team name is, and my script would go out there and look for that team tag, pluck it out using a regular expression, and basically add up the points for each minute they hold it. So once per minute, more or less, it goes out and goes, OK, who currently owns this box? I'll give them a point. And it keeps going and going and going. Occasionally, the referees will step in. Like, if someone's owned the box so badly that no one's ever going to get a chance to get any more points on it, and you want to make it a little more equal, then, well, the referee might step in and fix it or pull out that box, put in a new type of uh, OS, like, you know, pull out a Linux box, put out an OS2 box just to fuck with people. <laughs> so the general rules are you can only penetrate the host's given, not the scoring box. There's some exceptions to that. Uh, Accessing other players to like you know throw up goat seal or whatever that might be okay. It's not not too malicious. Uh, the scoring box I basically said it because I'm pretty sure my code is not perfect, so I don't want someone to screw up the coding box too bad, uh, the scoring box too bad. But you are allowed to poison the traffic to the scoring box, which becomes important later. I left that rule in there because I knew what people were going to do and I want to see them do it. Uh, you dosing and network traffic attacks are allowed even on the uh, traffic coming in and out of the contestants and scoring box. Though, keep in mind, DOSing is kind of a, um, well, it's going to cause you problems as far as making scores. Because if you DOS the box you're trying to attack, then you won't, you'll keep other people getting points from it. Because the scoring box won't be able to read that team tag, but you also won't get any either. Uh, you got to stay on the network, car, net car for network while attacking. Because we were doing this at Churchill Downs, and I didn't think Churchill Downs would be very happy with us um, attacking the network. So that rule was put in place. I think I've ran this maybe four times since then, but that was the first time. Uh, the ref may change other rules at will. By the way, this and the previous rule I mentioned about the refs acting as blue team, you've got to be careful to be fair, and you've got to seem unbiased, because sometimes you, you might have friends that are playing as well, and you don't want to seem like you're, oh, you're getting too many points. I'll pull that box out. So you've got to kind of play it fair, maybe have multiple people referees. It kind of becomes debatable. At the same time, you don't want someone owning the boxes too early and keeping them owned and scoring all the points and then the game just becomes uninteresting and no one wants to play because there's no chance that anybody but the person who got the lead is going to win. All right, the scoring engine. The first version I ever wrote was in Auto at 3. Has anybody ever used Auto at 3? It's Windows only, but as far as simple Windows scripting and making a little self-standing EXE for automation work, it's really awesome. It's easy to use. It's basic like syntax. Uh, you can do the whole automatic mouse and keyboard uh, sending of keystrokes and you know, tie things into the registry, uh, use uh, WMI calls. It's just, it's just really, really simple for some things in Windows. But it's, once again, Windows only. So the first time I ever ran it, I made my scoring code in Auto at 3. I decided to rewrite it in Python. And a few goals I have on this is, first of all, make it fast. Non-blocking, non-blocking as in if it can't open up a particular website, it doesn't keep trying forever and ever until it times out. It makes it time out faster, so it's closer to that whole 60-second mark I mentioned, where each minute it tries to check each box. And I also had to make it uh, cross-site scripting resistant, because I didn't want people getting there and using their team tag to be a cross-site scripting attack. By the way, speaking of weird cross-site scripting vectors, has anybody ever taken the browser user agent and made it a cross-site scripting attack? Just phone that I did out there. Was that? Casey probably doing it, but I thought someone might, you know, email me or say, Aiden, why the hell are you doing this? Because anything I'd redirect them to would probably piss them off, and they'll go and see my home address when I go around. I suppose I could set it up to only. Only when I'm using proxies, but oh, it's certainly doable. But login is not Larry. 
Logan is not Larry? Okay, I'll have to keep that in mind. That's the password, kid. All right, as far as how the netcode is configured, essentially I have this little INI file that the Python script reads, and it knows the name of each box and what IP address, or at least what, I should say, what web page to look at to check for that title tag I mentioned before. The sleep time is the number of seconds between each check, and the out file is where to output this file, which is basically the scores. So I mentioned before, you can web surf like 10, 0, 0, 99. Um, that's wherever we actually have the scores. Now, hopefully, we'll have a Netcoff game running later on in the in the conference. <laughs> With any luck, how's that coming along, not Larry? Um, it might be going. It might be going. Yeah, I gotta go check. All right, well, why don't you go check and if you if you find it is, let me know the IP address and we'll show this, what the scoreboard looks like. All right, well that's good. All right, a little demo time what the code looks like. Let me move over. Essentially, the code is uh, not too complicated. We've got some comments. Add to add a couple libraries in, and essentially, it just goes over and over and checks each one of those. Does a few things to hopefully uh, mitigate cross-site scripting attacks, and adds up the individual scores. Does a little regex to find the team tag in each, and. Uh, also figures out the total score and just keeps doing this like every 60 seconds and adding it up. There's a bunch of crap code in there. I'm not saying I'm a particularly good Python programmer, but the code the last couple times I ran it seems to work. Uh, it fills everything into a simple text file for scoring, though this one currently doesn't have anything in it of interest. Do you have that, uh, I need to upload it shortly. I, if you really want it immediately, I can get it to you at the conference. I need to post it. I have been Drag my feet on posting it because I think my code's really ugly. But um, I, here's my plan. When I post this video, um, or shortly after posting this video, I hope to post the code up there as well. Okay, are you putting it on your website? Yes. Well, I've already posted um, a few of the videos from this conference already. So you just check out my Twitter feed, and I have them linked to there. All right. Uh, you have a template. This is what the page is going to look like. So you can modify this if you want it to be something different. Um, I just have some artwork that uh, Rob Dixon cobbled together with some other things. And it would basically list the scores right here. Uh, I don't currently have any scores in this one, but that's what's going on with that. So I try to make it fairly flexible. You can change the way the scoreboard looks. Uh, I'm not exactly a great uh, web designer, so that's just what I came up with. But it's not too difficult to run, and essentially you just had the Python script running in the background, uh, scoring away. All right, now here's what's went down the previous times I've run this game. And I think I've only ran it like four times so far. One of the oddest things is Windows 98 is apparently the most secure OS ever. <laughs> no one owns it. I want to tell you the only way people ever owned it was when I opened up the entire C drive, read write to the world. And even then, people weren't owning it. <laughs> Actually, no. Depending on what you're doing with it, I mean, if it's just sitting there on the network, it, doesn't, it wasn't that unstable. Um, but, you know, here's what the people who actually owned it were either running OS 10 or Android clients, and here's what we figured out why. Because newer versions of Windows, like Vista and newer, weren't sending land manual challenge response by default. So they couldn't actually log in, because that was all Windows 98 by default would understand. Newer versions of Windows had that disabled by default. So these older, older clients, or clients that have uh, extra compatibility modes built in, like some of the Android SMB clients and OS X, could connect and modify the files. Newer versions of Windows couldn't, unless they did some modifications, so they'd actually send land man. So even after I opened up the entire C drive to the world, people still weren't owning it. I also had an issue once when I had this friend who's a really great pen tester, very bright on security matters, but he wasn't really experienced with Windows. So he had to figure out where iNet Pub was to actually be able to modify the web page and deface it with his team tag. All right, and a little bit later on, hopefully, we'll announce it. I think, not Larry, did you have uh, like a handout to give people who want to play the game? I, no, did not get a handout. Sorry. Can you give, give them like IP ranges if they come by a table? I'll have it written down. Yes, I will get that handout. 
All right, thanks a lot, Larry. All right, another, another observation I have is that traffic is king. The people who win seem to win not by hacking the boxes, but by hacking the traffic. Basically, they do alt poisoning and maybe use EDOCAP and modify the traffic to put their team tag in whatever the score box sees. <laughs> and I designed it that way for it to work. And you know what? Someone at one of the conferences was saying, well, that doesn't even seem fair. It seems like this other team should win because this other team kind of cheated because they were modifying the traffic. From a corporate image standpoint, do you really care if someone hacks your website and defaces it, or if they reroute all your traffic through one of their own sites and puts up a defaced website? From a public image standpoint, it looks like the same thing to end users. Point, point taken. So they wouldn't be using art poisoning, but let's say they uh, hacked your DNS servers and pointed your traffic to them. So it'd be a little different, but similar concept applies. So basically, all they did was they man and middle the pages and uh, changed it to score box C's. Is it fair? Eh, I was expecting it, so I put it in the rules that they're allowed to do it. From, like I said, from a corporate image standpoint, it's basically the same thing. Though the next time I ran the game, I made sure I had the parents already preset to where I could make a static op table. Because quite frankly, it gets really boring where people are basically op poisoning back and forth in the network. And I wanted them to give it up and try other techniques. Because that was the most powerful technique. So everybody instantly goes, well, it's like playing Quake. You instantly go for the BFG if you have it. So I did that so that they would, um, and these are basically the commands in uh, Windows and Linux to set up static op, and I'd make a static op between the score box and each one of the boxes it was trying to score from. I also have, um, strangely enough, an auto it script again for making it static op tables for your uh, Windows box. Another thing that people um, aren't trying I find interesting is password reuse. Like I'll set up a bunch of VMs and I'll have the Windows VM and the Linux VM have the same password. Like the administrator password on one will be the same as the root password on the other. But few if any people ever bothered to try the password or crack the password in the Windows box and then take it and use it on the Linux box. I have no idea why. And so what? I'm an incredibly lazy person. I think about using it all the time. <laughs> I think about the lazy shit I've done in the past, like, hmm, I wonder if they're dumb enough to have done this too. <laughs> See, I don't have high self-esteem. I have low self-esteem, but I also have low respect for everyone else, so. <laughs> At least it's a very depressing life for me, but so far it's been fairly accurate to my worldview. <laughs> All right, time allocation is also important. I've seen people get hung up in boxes. I gotta own this box. I gotta own this box. Dude, there's low hanging fruit over there you get points on. Go own that crap and get some points. But instead, it's like, ooh, like we put Matilda Day up. Matilda Day is this project I started um, for implementing the OWASP top 10 deliberately, making a very vulnerable web application. Kind of like WebGoat, but it's supposed to be a lot easier for people to train up on, and it's also Python based. Jeremy Druin's taken it over and done way more with it than I ever have. I'm not much of a uh, programmer. Jeremy's much, much better than I am, and he's done great things with the project. But we put that up, but since it's all kind of reflected cross-site scripting, or it's uh, cross-site scripting for a particular user that has to log in, and the scoring box wasn't logging in. People were trying to pwn it, but no one could actually pwn it in such a way that they could get their team tag in. So that caused some complications. Also, people weren't automating nearly as much as you might hope they would. Like adding things to, as soon as someone else changes the script, or changes the, um, sorry, changes the home page, it automatically changes it back. I didn't really see people doing that. And some of them have played the game multiple times. So my hope is when I get this game to be more common, people will find better ways to script it to where they automatically go, oh, you replaced my page? I'll replace it back with mine. And have this whole war going on of who can actually write the most efficient code to automatically repone a system when someone else fixes it. So get good at scripting. Now I have some ideas to make this more interesting in the future and screw with people. Uh, Interconnectivity, like maybe if you happen to have a hack on this one particular box, maybe have some R shell services on the other box that they can get into and make them actually think, 
of the systems, not separate systems, but it's interconnected. Uh, false flags, like maybe put some fake password files that don't actually work and see if people go for it. Or maybe put up a web page that says, or put up an IIS install, have the INET pub directory there, but not actually have it contain the real web page, have the web page contain someplace else. Now, I believe someone did do that in one of the games. They went in and said, huh, I'm going to confuse the other teams. I'm going to leave the INET pub there, or it may have been uh, actually VAR WWW. I don't remember if he did it on the Linux box or the IIS box. But they like remapped it. So they knew where to hack it, but the other people had no idea. Unless they went into the, like, the Apache configs or went into the uh, IIS configs and figured out where it had been remapped for the root. Uh, fairness and referees of blue team, like I was mentioning before, you kind of got to be a blue team and make things somewhat equal, make them interesting, occasionally come in and fix boxes. But when you do that and why you do that, there is fairness issues involved with that. I was mentioning that already, moving around of uh, www or inet pub. Now, that's basically the beginning of netcoff. But I had no idea for a game I'd like to try to design sometime later and run. And that is Digital Demolition Derby. Con. Uh, essentially, the idea is you bring your own laptop and we give you VMs to run. Maybe a Windows VM and a Linux VM. And they'll be vulnerable out of the box. And essentially, everybody knows the IPs to each one of those, and the goal is you got to own everybody else's box, and they're all trying to own your two VMs. And it's like a demolition derby. And the question becomes, do you patch first, or do you go ahead and own other people's boxes first? So it's kind of like Netcoff, but more distributed across everybody's laptops. The problem is, it depends on what hardware everybody has, and scoring be a bit more of a pain to organize. But I thought it might be an interesting concept for a game. The original concept is just bring the most hardened box you could, and everybody fight it out on the network. But <sighs> I imagine that would get real boring with a whole lot of people, unless they want to drop zero days. Um, it may not be the most interesting game in the world. But I think this game has a lot of nasty potential. I just, uh, haven't actually designed it out and, or run it yet. Well, that's pretty much it for my talk. Sorry it's as short as it was. Hopefully, people get a chance to play the game a little bit later on. Uh, I have write-ups on uh, previous experience of this game on my website. If you just do a search for Netcoff. Uh, quick announcement I'd like to make. Uh, DerbyCon 2013 is coming up September 26th through 29th, so quite a ways off. Here's a few of our team members. I also want to give shout-outs to other uh, conferences I go to, like Louisville InfoSec, SkydogCon, HackerCon, AutoZone, Freaknik, which I think you all already know about, and NotaCon. Finally, are there any questions? It's, it's more professional thing. It's run by a local ISSA group. Uh, m most ISSA groups aren't very technical. Mine's not exactly uber technical, but it's more technical than most. Uh, it's a good bunch of people, and they, uh, I get a lot of free food for them. So I, you know, I show up at the uh, monthly meetings, and they feed me. I show up at the Christmas dinner, they feed me. I show up at the conferences, they feed me. I mean, the money I've spent on uh, membership there has definitely paid me back in food. And it's also a good place to network for your local ISA, like at least in Louisville, if I want to know, if, if I needed the job at Humana or UPS, that seems to be the two major companies, I know people from each one of those and a bunch of other smaller companies from around the area. So the local ISSA is a good place to network. Any other questions? Okay, I'd be interested in seeing how that actually turned out because a lot of them are. Well, I kind of like my first CTF, I figured it was going to be kind of one sided. It was like, okay, college students, college students, Dave Kennedy and Martin Boss and Archangel and a couple other guys who didn't look like any slouches either. I'm like, yeah, I think I already know who the hell is going to win this shit. Oh, I, I didn't mention, I mentioned, I was going to mention a story. Um, one of the phrases you had to get a password on that CTF I first ran was there was this webcam. And you had to get the password for the webcam. And I think I was like maybe sending it out across the network. You could just sniff it. But there was a 
post-it note on the computer that had the password. And the webcam was focused, like, I don't know, 45 degrees off angle. And they hacked the webcam, but they didn't realize they could turn the webcam. So they were like, would have won the game 45 minutes earlier or something if they just turned the camera to look at the post-it note. Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of ways you can run the scenario. I'm not sure how often I'd ever want to try to run that because it requires more hardware and people to actually bring their own laptops or me to supply them. The Netcoff one's a lot simpler to run, which the whole point of it was to be a lazy bastard. Anybody else? Well, in that case, I thank you for your time.